Everyone has a story. I get them to tell it. Welcome to the Aaron Bender Podcast, conversations with media personalities about their personal and professional lives and journeys. Really appreciate all your support, all the downloads, all the views on YouTube or nightly at 11 p.m. Pacific or 2 a.m. Eastern on DBNA TV at dbnatelevision.tv or streaming with the DBNA TV app on Amazon Fire, Roku, and Apple TV or listening on your favorite platform. Before we get to my conversation with Steve Weish, a little about my story. I'm a widowed dad of two girls who just lost their mom a grieving husband, a man in recovery trying to reconnect with the world with fresh eyes, faith, and perspective, a college journalism professor, a white guy in a world of injustice, a 20-year broadcast media veteran who had his dream job and then lost it. A year and a half ago, God gave me a gift, an opportunity to stop, step back, and breathe so I could learn about love, vulnerability, forgiveness, grace, self-care, patience, and understanding. Steve Weish is an NFL Network analyst. He's also co-host of the Huddle and Flow podcast. In his more than 30-year career, he has broken major stories like the Colin Kaepernick kneeling during the anthem, Michael Vick's dogfighting, and Michael Jordan joining the Wizards. He is a graduate of Howard University, grew up in St. Louis and Minneapolis. In looking at your bio, I, I feel like prior to summer of last year, I would have seen Minneapolis and I would have just kind of brushed right past it. Like, oh, okay, he's from Minneapolis, but let's focus on St. Louis. Let's focus on the career. But Minneapolis thrust into the spotlight last year. How did you, as somebody born in Minneapolis, yes, spent most of your time growing up in St. Louis, but how how did that impact you? And how did you watch everything unfold over the last 15 months in Minneapolis? Well, look, I mean, you know, first off, nothing was more horrifying than watching, you know, the ex-Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin, uh, kill George Floyd with a knee on the neck. Um, You know, and knowing that I spent nine years of my life and still have ties to that community, um, you know, it's a little more frightening. I mean, and I know it hit home um, with a lot of players who, who, a lot of people who aren't from Minneapolis. I mean, I did something with Anthony Barr and Eric Kendricks and, you know, Amir Abdullah, you know, things like the guys who play for the Vikings who aren't from Minneapolis, but knowing that it is an incredibly diverse community, not just black and white, but you have Hmong, you have a lot of Ethiopian, you have a lot of Somalian, a lot of diverse cultures there. And the fact that they rose up, that the way that they did, that everybody of every culture, including Caucasians, you know, said, this is not a matter of police versus citizen this is not a matter of you know a white man against a black man this is a matter of right versus wrong and there's no way anymore as much as we have seen this go on that we can sit on our hands so you know and and that was you know powerful to me to see it to do what i do on air to lead discussions about it um because we've seen it a million times it just this just happened to be in minneapolis but you know what by lando castile happened right there in the Twin Cities as well in 2016. And there wasn't this uproar when he was shot in his car next to his wife with his child in the back seat. And the only uproar that came from that is when Colin Kaepernick decided not to stand for the national anthem. And, you know, now here we are five years later, there's a lot of people who couldn't vote back in 2016, who were 14 years old back then and really didn't know what a whole lot was going on in society they were the ones in the street right they were the ones leading the charge and you know it it was it was very impressive to see um i think that the judicial system um finally playing out you know it's you know proper jewish prudence uh even though derek chauvin you know the 22 years he got uh probably isn't enough yeah but it is what it is the fact that there was some type of justice administered um goes to show you how far we've come in this one instance i'm not going to say this is a broad statement but in this one instance yeah. um of society minneapolis and the judicial system you know stepping forward for once what do you think changed from 2016 to 2020 obviously we're here in 21 we've already gotten the sentencing of derek chauvin but what do you think changed from the philando castile well i mean i hope, I hope people don't, you know, take this flippantly, but I think it's because we were in the pandemic and everybody was at home watching. They didn't have a distraction. They couldn't say, I'm going to work. Oh, that's a terrible thing that just happened. Here we go again. 
everybody. Yeah, they home. only catch it maybe on that 45 minute commute to work on the radio. Correct. And then boom, flip it off. Maybe it's not water cooler discussion at the office because now yeah. those water cooler discussions, that's, that's with your wife. That's with your son. That's with whoever's at the house with extended family who maybe you don't get into discussions like that, except for once or twice a year at holidays. But it was also on Twitter. It was also on the news. It was, it was something that because we were home and we were watching the news so much because, you know, we were watching everything that happened in politics back then. We were watching everything that was happening in the streets. And then the fact that this was, this was a, a I want an exclamation point, but a huge, you know, you know, uh, I guess event on top of Amato Arbery and Brianna Taylor and, and other things that had happened earlier that summer. It's like, whoa. So I, I honestly, I think because we didn't have in the sports world, major league baseball or talk about the NFL really going on at a time like this or the NBA, even though the playoffs are going on, it was still, we're talking about this pandemic. And now this is in front of our eyes. People aren't home, so they can take to the streets, right? They can march. They can, you know, call their friends or Zoom their friends or whatever and have this discussion. I think that was more of an impetus than all of a sudden society as a whole, all of a sudden have this, having this great moral compass saying we finally have to do what's right. What do you remember about that move from Minneapolis to St. Louis and what prompted that move south? Well, I was nine years old um, when that happened. And that was my, my father. He had worked at General Mills, you know, that makes all of the, the cereals and things like that. He had a job uh, in St. Louis. And so we all, we all moved down to the Midwest. Uh, and it was, a, it was a big change for me. Um, it was a city where, uh, where we lived, where we first moved, you know, where I lived in Minneapolis. There were people of all races and, and things right there in North Minneapolis. And where we moved to St. Louis, you know, our family was it. We were it in terms of uh, people of color. And to a lot of people, especially at that age, I, I was new to them. I wasn't on TV. I wasn't, you know, the, the image of what they saw on TV. So a lot of people were curious. A lot of people were mean. Got in a lot of fights. Took no L's, by the way. Um, <laughs> thank God it was big. <laughs> you know, they, thank God I still had some of these when I was little. Um, but yeah, it was different. But no, I, I, it was a great. It was it was a great place. You know, eventually, it was a great place to grow up and learn a lot of life lessons. How did you? I, I don't want to put words in your mouth to say, oh, there, there was some resentment that grew out of that because you're like, hey, we we were doing fine in Minneapolis. Why do we have to up and move? So I'll, I'll ask first, was there any resentment for your your father, for your parents picking you up and moving and putting you in the situation where it's like, oh, wait a minute, I wasn't getting any fights in Minneapolis. What the heck? Oh, I was going to fight in Minneapolis too, but not, <laughs> not for the reason, not for the reasons I was getting into them in, uh, in St. Louis. But no, I mean, I was a little kid. You know, and it was great because, you know, I got to the age, I was like nine years old and I started playing little league baseball and youth league basketball and youth league football and everything, you know, worked out well. You know, I was always one of the better players on every team I was on. I always played on really good teams, I ended up making great friends. My parents made great friends. And so, like I said, it ended up being just a fantastic place um, to grow up and, and learned a lot of life's lessons to be able to understand how certain people on a certain side of the political aisle may feel because I grew up in that environment as opposed to how I may feel and how other people may feel. So no, I'm, I, I wouldn't change a thing. You know, I, I no resentment at all. Uh, sports wise, you, you brought up basketball. You brought, what, what was your favorite growing up? Oh God, probably basketball until, until I reached a certain age when football was my best sport. I was also really good at baseball, but I had a shoulder injury um, and I was a pitcher. Yeah. I still got that. So, I, I still, yeah, I, I can't, can't, can't get can't. it done anymore. Yeah. Oh. But um, yeah. And once I got into high school, I realized that football is where the bread was going to be buttered. I was, I was, you know, I was six, two. Um, so I was, you know, decent size for a shooting guard, but I hated the system. It's a terrible, selfish thing to say that the high school ran. Because on our youth league team, we were always great, not just good. We traveled. We were great because we got the rebound and we were running. We were UNLV, you know, back in the Stacey Augman, Greg Anthony. Yeah, days. yeah. 
Um, we got to high school and it was walk the ball up the court. It was, we're playing man to man defense, no matter what. And I'm kind of like, man, the lack of strategy and the lack of urgency, I'm done with this. I'm not used to this stuff. So I was, I was a little selfish and a little baby, but you know, it helped, helped me focus more on, uh, on baseball and football as well. The idea of then writing about sports, mm -hmm. covering sports, becoming, you know, still, still being a part of the sports world. Where did that come in? Well, I mean, that, that's always been part of it. You know, people think I'm joking when I say this, but you know, I, I always, I've, since I was young, I always learned to play to my strengths, and I realized I was not good at math or science. And so I knew if I was going, to, as I got older, since I was good in the language arts is what we called it in high school, and then English is what we called it in college. Since though that was a strength of mine, and I was a good writer, and I was an avid reader. Um, you know, I just really got into the writing aspect of it. Our, our high school had a really good newspaper. So I was first a reporter, then a sports editor, then the editor in chief of the high school paper. Um, and it also helped my father. Uh, you know, he was a, an account executive. He was head of the sales department at the NBC affiliate in St. Louis. So I was always around it, right? Even though he wasn't on air, you know, a couple of the anchors who worked there worked out at the gyms I worked out in. I'd go to the studio sometimes and, uh, when I would go visit him, my parents ended up divorcing, but I would go visit him just when I was old enough to drive and hang out at the studio. And so that's just something that really pushed me. And then seeing Brian Gumble, um, back then he was an NBC, NBC was a real sports or something like that back in the day. I was like, I want to be like that guy. And so even though I was playing sports and competing in sports, um, I was like, wow, this is something I, I really want to do. And in fact, when I was getting recruited, uh, play college football you know I turned some schools away um either by when they asked we want to major in and I said journalism I said well we don't have a journalism program I'd say well it's you know if you have nothing really similar to offer that's what I want to do and they may not have ever called me again or I may have told them like yeah look I'm going to go to University of Missouri um to pursue their journalism program because it was one of the best in the country at the time yeah it's it well still is absolutely. still is yeah absolutely yeah. Uh, how did you during college, what was that experience like for you? You know, you stayed in Missouri. Obviously, it made such an impact on you that you that you stayed in state. What was that college experience like? Well, I did that first off, like like most kids, no matter where you grow up, you kind of want to go to your big state college, right? You want to get from Ohio, want to go to Ohio State, get from Michigan, want to go to Michigan State or University of Michigan. So that that played that played a role in it. But I mean, it was also a football recruiting. Um deal yeah and you know it came down to i had some opportunities to go to some smaller schools and missouri came in kind of late after it looked like it was going to be them the whole way they're like look we're going to give the scholar we had for you to a, a junior college player who was ended up being a really good player much better than me um and said but would you come in and walk on i said yeah you know and they, they took care of some things and i walked on um there for a couple of years and made a lot of headway um and then the coaches got fired and the new coaching staff came in, Woody Woodenhofer and his crew. And they, they made it kind of clear, like, if you weren't, you know, a rotational guy yet or, you know, a starter, then, you know, their recruits were going to get the first dibs. Right, right. And I, and I saw the handwriting on the wall. And that's when I decided to transfer out of Missouri to a Howard University in Washington, D.C. What was that experience like? The greatest, the greatest. <laughs> I, I'm just, it, now we're back to baseball, but now it's T-ball. I'm just going to set it up and, and ask yeah. you to talk about your Howard experience. It was the great. I mean, look, <laughs> it, it was weird because I was going to transfer and play football. And I looked at a lot of places that had recruited me before. And some of them were like, come on. Yeah, we're ready to, to bring you in. And then I just happened to be home like on a Thanksgiving break. And I told one of my best friends at the time, one of the few black kids uh, at my high school, over at the house, I was like, look, I'm going to transfer, you know, I really wish, because he stayed home to go to community college, I was like, I really wish you'd come with me, we can go somewhere, you were a great running back, we could be back together again, he's like, let's go to a black school, we've never really had a black experience, and I was like, it's a great idea, because um, I never was recruited by an HBCU, and that's a big thing, you know, HBCUs don't have huge recruiting budgets, and so um, and we, we should mention also, I mean, we're, we're talking about the eighties here. Eighties. Now I feel like there's a, there's a brighter spotlight and thankfully on HBCUs, right. But in the eighties, 
I mean, we're, we're talking about like, wait, wait a minute, you're going where? Well, I mean, look, in the 80s, it was Grambling, it was Southern, it was Tennessee State, uh, schools like that. It, but, um, you know, here it was, okay, let me apply to Howard and then let me apply to Hampton um, in Virginia, where my, my parents actually went to school and got accepted by Howard. Their head football coach at the time, Willie Jeffries, knew me from when he coached at Wichita State and had uh, watched a film with me there. He was like, come on, we got you. Um, and, but by the time in like a the four or five month lag between deciding to transfer and actually getting there, because now when people transfer, you go right away. Then I had to finish the semester at Missouri and they didn't have like an early summer program back then. I mean, they didn't have that back then. And so by the time I got to summer ball, I was like, I'm done, right? Because I was one of these guys who naturally like today walk around at about 215, 220, and I had to lift, you know, to keep the weight on. So I was like constantly lifting to stay at 230, 235. And by the time, uh, you know, that happened, I was like, you know, I'm kind of done. It just feels so unnatural yeah. to me to keep the weight on. And as they say in football vernacular, I lost my stinger. Um, even though I'd watched those games at Howard and like, man, at worst, I could have been all conference, you know, and, yeah, and so, yeah. but, but I, I enjoyed just the whole experience of, you know, not playing sports for the first time in my life and becoming a student and the competitive nature I had um, really pushing me with a, with a competitive group. I mean, Stan Verrett, the sports center anchor from ESPN, him and I graduated together, Gus Johnson. Uh, cold calls games for Fox. He was yeah. a year or two behind me and Stan. Michelle Miller, who does the news at CBS this morning, she graduated with Stan. So we had this incredibly um, gifted, and I'm talking about the broadcast journalists, this incredibly gifted group of journalists who just, we just stepped on each other's throats trying to, to be better than one another in, in a very friendly way. And, you know, that, that really helped is, is, you know, I went through learning a new city, being around people of color, for the first time in my life yeah majority right, right majority right at hbcu and it what, just you know everything everything fit very nicely we, we talk about somebody moving on the other side of the world and there's some culture mm -hmm. shock or you, you you have somebody growing up in california where it's all kinds of diversity and then you go to wisconsin or you know montana not to stereotype but okay wisconsin you know i uh, think the and, demographics speak for themselves <laughs> yes um was there a bit of culture shock for you going from yes, diverse in Minneapolis, not so much in St. Louis in where, where you grew up in St. Louis to all of a sudden now you're at an HBCU. I think it was more in my head initially. I was scared. Like, Oh my gosh, I'm a suburban kid. Am I going to be black enough? Am I going to be able to find a group of friends? And then I get there and I realize that the majority of the campus of students on campus came from circumstances like I did. So that you had that kind of natural, fit but at the same time you know look you're in dc in the 80s it was the murder cap of the world i mean crack was all over the place you had drug kingpins and all this so i'm learning how to navigate you know the streets and and and, and all this because it wasn't just random in dc it was everywhere i mean all the students at georgetown and american university and georgia I mean, the Washington. mayor was doing it right <laughs> exactly <laughs> so i mean so, it's, it's so, said that i i remember that as a kid of yeah. the 80s my only DC memory growing up in the news was Marion Barry. Marion Barry. Yeah. So, I mean, so you had all of the stuff that you were kind of navigating. And as I tell people, you know, I, it made me a man. You know, I went there as a transfer. So I was like 20, 21 years old anyway. So I was older than a lot of the people who were coming in with me initially. And so within a week, I was like, okay, I know how to kind of navigate situations I've never dealt with before. I've kind of met a group of friends from St. Louis who are helping, helping me guide through this. And then once I got into the classrooms and really got into it, now I had some professors who were like, okay, this dude works his tail off, a talented writer, we're going to help him along. I mean, they really identified me and they pushed me to the point, you know, I was the editor of the, you know, the student paper, the community news, there were two, I was the editor of the community newspaper. And so I was covering news and things like that. But the great part was being in DC, the Washington Post would hire like 12 college students to cover high school sports on uh, football season and basketball season. And so Howard said, Steve, we're going to, you know, one of my professors there, Barbara Hines, hooked me up, got me a job over there, did a good job there. The post allowed me after those seasons to write more stories. So by the time I applied for some jobs coming out of college, I was good. And my resume was thorough. And then to have 
you know, to be able to have the sports editor of the Post vouch for me, um, you know, when the people from the Richmond Virginia Times Dispatch called, I mean, after the interview, I was hired. It, it was, it was, it was, and that was, you know, two or three weeks before I graduated. So that's so why I say it was a going to Howard and being in DC offered up opportunities that I don't think I would have had at Missouri and it op- offered up some maturity and mental opportunities that I probably would not have discovered if I didn't leave home. And we'll get back to your return to the post uh, Mm -hmm. more than a decade later as a beat writer for the NBA and the Wizards. But I want to, before we get too far away from your playing days, any concussions, any issues in that arena? Yes, there were concussions. (laughs) There were back then though, it was, you know, take two Advil and get back on the field. And someone like me who was, you know, pushing to get up the depth chart, I didn't have time to get hurt, man. But all everybody, I mean, all the dudes, we would just sit around sometimes, you know, and almost console each other without consoling each other. Like, man, you know, I, I got, you know, I got to just sit here and you just talk to me. Like, we knew it, but we didn't because back then no one was talking about concussions. It was yeah. Like, did know, they got, even call it a concussion at, at, at that point? I mean, yeah, but it wasn't. It wasn't a discussion. It was like you know, if a dude got stretched out in practice because you know we were hitting in practice back then. There wasn't no thud. We were hitting. Yeah. The guy got stretched out in practice and didn't get up. He was a punk. He had to can't take a hit. And so you had to get up. If you had to take a knee for a minute or two, you did it, but you got back in there. And there were times, you know, I would feel worse three weeks later after the one, one or two particular hits um, than I did initially. And, and I didn't understand the depth of the concussions. So now I'm hoping, you know, I'm not stumbling or doing anything or having memory loss that I would feel that's, that's concussion related. You know, I never played in a game, but practice is where most of the stuff really happens. That's the unspoken being the NFL, major league soccer, hockey. That's the unspoken where most of these things really, they don't happen. Then the stage is set in practice. Um, but me, I've, I've seen the vicious, vicious uh, things go on, but in terms of personally, no, but I tell you what, going through all that helped me recognize that my son played high school football. When he came home one day and was kind of talking crazy, I was like, uh, you know, call his coach. He's got a concussion. He's sitting out for a while. We're going to, you know, we'll gauge him, you know, later in the week and, and see yeah. how he's doing. Yeah, I was going to ask, you've got three sons. What yep. kinds of conversations, um, you know, we've, we've talked about so much already mm-hmm. in the 20 minutes we've talked about uh, race relations in this country. Uh, police and uh, minority communities, those relations in this country, concussions. What mm-hmm. kinds of conversations have you had with your three sons about all of those topics? Uh, every, every, you know, every last bit of them. I mean, look, you know, when it comes to the race relations, it's the same. It's a story you hear over and over about, hey, when you get in the car to drive or even as a passenger, you know, take, take this down, right? When, you got, when you've got this up, it comes down. Make sure people can see you, you know, comply as much as you can because you never know. Don't let them search your car. Call me first if they'll allow you to call. If not, we'll come get you from the police station. Um, look, the biggest difference between I, when, I, when I was their age and them is we didn't have social media. We didn't have camera phones, right? We were on an island. I used to get where I grew up. Some of the stuff that the police did with me, you know, if I had a cell phone, it would have been great, but I didn't. And so, you know, for these guys, it's been a little different, but there have been some very painful, painful um, lessons, no matter, you know, what you tell your children, you know, until they experience it, that's when it really hits home. And it's been some very heartbreaking, um, you know, painful experiences that they've had to go through. And then we we eventually had to go through as a family to make them realize, yeah, this is real. You're not going to be treated um, the same all the time, no matter how how great it feels. So be it from that stuff to concussions, to how to treat women, things like that. You know, we, we've run the gamut, my wife and I have trying to cover all the bases, but again, like, like any, like we had to go through until you experience it. Some of those words are just, you know, words until like, ah, that's a mom and dad. Man. We look at the calendar and here it is 2021. When I tell you that you've been in the business for more than three decades, how does that hit you? It's weird because, you know, I just started doing TV not long ago. So I feel like I'm really at the beginning of, of this career. 
in terms of being overall journalism now, you know, with all of this and, <laughs> and everything. Is that the I, journalism I have, or the three sons? <laughs> <laughs> the kids <laughs> and how much worse would it be if it was three girls oh <laughs> i've got two downstairs right now they're six and eight and, oh my goodness uh just the the gray just on the sides already uh and in the beard i i pressure the peer pressure <laughs> you know that they went through and i'm just like with the girls because i've got a 14 year old niece peer pressure is insane so it's yeah. it's got it's 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 an interesting ride um but yeah, I mean, look, I've accepted the role as kind of the sage. My whole purpose now, besides informing and educating and, and, and enlightening the audience that I serve as a writer and as a television broadcaster, is to lift up, is to bring, I mean, any college student that DMs me or whatever that wants to talk, or at, I'm, I talk to them because I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to age out. It's not, like I said, I'm just getting into this, but I'm 55 years old. And some just, you know, the network could be like, okay, just because of your age, you're done. Right. You know, that it, it happens like that sometimes. Now, if I'm still bringing quality and I'm, and I'm not detached from a younger audience or trying to attract, okay, that's good. And that's why I really have tried to, you know, step, you know, sp speak a little bit more loudly in the social justice realm, in the um, indigenous realm, in, in the, you know, the Polynesian culture realm to, to say, these are audiences that were not really focused on that we should because they're there and so i've tried to make myself unique i'm constantly trying to recreate myself because you know television is, is a different monster compared to writing um, but i'm glad i've had that you know for 20 years as a writer 20 plus years as a, as a sole writer no broadcast that i've got that journalistic base that I can always fall back on. I mean, the biggest story of my life, the Colin Kaepernick not standing for the national anthem story, that was a written story. That was not me breaking it on TV. So having that journalistic foundation to be able to recognize something when a camera wasn't there and to craft um, a very well-structured story, um, really, you know, I'm, I'm glad I had the experience that I had, because if I had only been in the game for five years and saw that, I would not have handled it probably the way that I did. You surprised Cap is still not in the league, or is it at this point, like, just kind of, well? Yeah, I mean, this what, point, what it's, it's done. Yeah, at this point, it's done. I mean, he's, you know, he hasn't played in years. I think he sees his career clearly is, is, is going in a different direction. He's got a lot of these production deals going, and uh, with Netflix and whatnot and his things that he does in the community. So look, I was surprised initially, but now, now that we see why and, and, and this and that, no, not, not at all. Uh, what are your memories of your Miami Herald days in the nineties and try to describe what you can without using Greg Cody and Dan Levitard's names? <laughs> love them. Love those two, by the way. I won't use their names, but what colleagues to learn from. And because uh, the second name you mentioned with three syllables in his last name actually lived by me. So, you know, he would come over all the time. Like, like we were, we were tight. We were cool. He'd come over to the house all the time. We'd hang out. Um, but no, it was great because, you know, I went down there to cover high school sports initially in a Fort Lauderdale bureau, not even in Miami. And I'm working with people like Judy Batista, who's an NFL network with me now, and Dave Shine, who's a great baseball writer at the Washington Post. And just a lot of people, you know, Scott Hyam, who's one of the best political investigative reporters at the Washington Post. So we have this brilliant, like, satellite Petri dish of great journalists. So, you know, I really learned a lot. Then I went to cover the Dolphins for a while. University of Florida football when Spurrier yeah. was there and just was the first guy to really open up the aerial attack. And then I covered the Dolphins for a while, Shula's last couple of years, um, Jimmy Johnson's first couple of years. I was the number two guy behind Arm Armando Salguero, who really taught me how to cover a beat, um, the grind it takes, how to work a source, how to really play things here and there. Um, and then eventually the Miami Heat. And I got the Miami Heat by default because we had like two reporters leave like Judy Batista left to go to the New York Times. So all of a sudden I'm thrust to cover the University of Miami Hurricanes football team. Um, right when a big investigation by our paper got them put on like multi-years of probation. So they hated the paper. Oh, yeah. Here I you go, Steve. My, Enjoy. Uh, yeah. Steve, you think you're going to break a story? <laughs> Not going to happen. Not going to happen. But, you know, I, you know, but I did it. I knew it was a short-term deal. 
uh, Butch Davis was coaching then. But then, so our Miami Heat writer left. So I went right into that. And that was awesome. Like I'd never covered the NBA. And, you know, as much as, you know, NFL players, I think mean, they're the best athletes. And you're seeing guys out there, 6'8", six, 6'9", six, running like gazelles and doing their things they do night after night. You're like, whoa, this is, you know, incredible. And this was during the era when it was the Heat, the Knicks, the Magic, and the Bulls competing for the Eastern Conference every year. So, I mean, I'm talking, this is when teams were knocked down, drag out wrestling too. So that was awesome. And that's what got me to the Washington Post was the coverage I had, you know, with so many really great playoff experiences and things like that. They recognized it and they brought me back because the Post does a great job of tracking people who used to work for them or interning oh, nice. or intern for them. So they tracked me. And so when they're like, okay, we've got an opening for the NBA and it's your time, we're going to, we're going to give you a call, you know, and when they called, I, I had to go. I did not want to leave Miami. I loved it. That's where I met my wife, where my kids were born. Had a lot of great family and friends there. As a Midwestern kid living in the tropics, I loved it. Um, but when that opportunity knocked, I had to take it. Yeah, I, I worked in Miami 04 to 07. And for the first two years, I lived across from Nova Southeastern, across from mm -hmm. the Dolphins training facility. I, don't I was know right there in Cooper City. I was right oh, there in Cooper City, right okay. by it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was, I was at that quarter deck, uh, caddy corner from that all the all time. time. That, that in the ale house, right? Oh, oh yeah. All, it sometimes South Florida weather would allow for me to walk over to the ale house and quarter deck was fine, but walk over to ale house. There was a pub across the street, kind of a dive, um, in that one that's kind of caddy corner from the dolphins training facility, but that whole little area don't sleep on Davy. Don't sleep on Davy. That little spot right there. You, and you get, has, you get and away from University Tropical. Avenue. <laughs> What's that? And it has a Pollo Tropical. <laughs> oh, <laughs> exactly. It's so good. It's so good. Um, covering the Wizards what, uh, and the NBA for the post, was it like, uh, it was the early 2000s. So that's, yeah, that's Michael Jordan time. Yeah. Oh, right? yeah. No, I broke that story. Oh, man. It, yeah, it. it just finding your, 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 yourself in these spots. It's, it's, it's one of those where it's like, well, I'm not lucking out. However, you put yourself in the situation where it's like, okay, I am ready for the moment and the moment is presenting itself. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the big story, a lot of people think, oh, you got to investigate this. And that. they fall in your, you know, they don't fall in your lap, but timing is everything. And so I go to the post right in the middle of the NBA lockout in 99. So there's a reduced 50 game season. I'm writing stories about labor that is just boring people to tears <laughs> to eight people that read it. And then. So wait, wait a minute. Know. Hold on. I'm going to stop you there. So Miami, Miami Herald, here's the beat for the hurricanes, by the way, uh, our story just uh, got them on probation and Oh, welcome to the post. You're the NBA beat writer. We're in a lockout. Enjoy. It would have happened if I was in Miami though, too. So I, I always look at it like that. I'm covering okay. the, heat. Yeah, the yeah. lockout was universal. <laughs> so I, I get there and then, so they have a truncated 50 game season. The Wizards went like 19 games are totally irrelevant. I think they fired Bernie Dicker staff. It was, it was horrible. And then they, uh, they hired Gar Hurd. It, it, I mean, they went through so many coaches when I was there and then, um, the whole MJ thing came around. That was the story I was really proud to break because I didn't talk to like anybody on the team except for one person who was confirming the information um, that I was getting from like lawyers and all this other stuff, like people who were actually brokering the deal. Um, and everyone's like, where did you get that information? Like I never spoke to Michael George's agent. Everyone thought, you know, David Falk was feeding. I'm like, nope, I'm getting this from places. Nobody's ever going to get it. And so I'm, you know, I'm leading the whole media court for days. Like even after it broke, they're chasing, they're chasing, they're chasing because I'm hitting them with all this different stuff. And so, um, you know, and, but, the, but the funny part about that, just to show you when you talked about my, my tenure in the business, this was the beginning of the internet, right? So when yes. you know, everybody would wake up, you know, every morning and read the paper to get their information and then they would use that, you know, as the way to drive their news cycle. And so we were, I was the covering a Wizards game in Indianapolis. And at 11 o'clock Eastern time, right before the local news broke, they posted the big headline, Michael Jordan coming to be the basket, head of basketball ops, part owner of the Wizards. And so people were like, yo, what's this? It's this internet thing, you know, Washington Post website. It's all over. This is before Twitter and all this stuff. Yep. So, you know, a couple of the other, my competitors are getting phone calls 
Like, all right, no, that's not true. That's not going on. I look at it, I'm like, yeah, it's happening. And MJ's, <laughs> MJ's coming. And, and so it was just a whole weird sequence of now the internet being the way to, to hit the Scud missile to kind of shake up the news cycle. So that was a, an interesting part just of the business. And then covering the team, you know, from, you know, MJ being in the front office and really kind of creating a rift with the existing folks because it was kind of like, that the, the organization never existed before his presence. You know, that's how right. a lot of people felt about it. You know, he drafted Kwame Brown. He was bringing in a lot of his buddies. And he came back to play. It was like, okay, I want the guys who I want to play with because I can't trust the young guys I drafted. On um, the hire Doug Collins, who was always great to me. He was, he was tough on some of the players, especially Kwame. But it went from a team that nobody cared about, half full arena, to no matter where we went. I mean – a million people. Michael was the guy. That era was the guy that got reporters to cover NBA shoot arounds. Because normally, like the teams do, they show up at the gym, like 11 from 11 to 12, and just loosen up for the day, finalize the game plan, go back to their hotel, and head back to the arena at like 4 30. Well, because Michael had so many media sources, you know, all over the country, like I had to be at these shoot arounds all the time because that's where they were going to find them. Right. So right. everybody started attending shooter. And now that is part of the job when you cover the NBA. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't me. It was MJ. It's all MJ. And so, watching the post and watching the post being the grind that it is. Um what went into the decision to then leave the post for the Atlanta Journal Constitution? Yeah, that was that was kind of a painful one. Um, we had a change of sports editors and it kind of became clear that even though things, you know, I did a good job on my beat that he wanted his own people there. And I saw it quickly. I, I saw it well ahead of some of my other colleagues. So I was like, Hmm, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to be covering the wizards next year, or covering Virginia tech football. Right. Right. And, um, and so, and it was, it was just dumb luck that my old assistant sports editor in Miami just calls me up. I'm in Detroit covering a wizards Pistons game. Hey, look, uh, I'm taking over the sports section in Atlanta. I want you to be my first hire. And at some point, I want to get you back on the NFL. I said, your timing could not be better. (laughs) And and it it was weird because I went down there actually to cover Georgia Tech hoops because they had just come off of playing for the national championship game with Jared Jack and that that group of people. And it was going to be a temporary thing, but I was prepped for this interview to go back and cover Georgia Tech hoops. And I get, I am in the building and this guy comes out and says, a job's no longer available. I'm like, what are you talking about? I mean, the Washington Post is offended that I'm taking this interview and I'm sure they've already made, made some calls to find my replacement. Like, yeah, we want you to cover Georgia, University of Georgia football. That's the biggest beat of the paper. I'm like, I can't, I can't live in Athens. That's an hour away. You know, I can't do that. You know, my wife works at the airport, I, you know, okay, live halfway. Uh, you cover it for a season and let's see if anything happens. I covered it for a season. It was actually great. You know, Mark Rick was the head coach, one of the most incredible human beings I've ever met. You had this great team with David Pollock and Odell Thurman and all these guys, you know, Thomas Davis, all these guys who wanted to play in the NFL. Um, and um, that following year, they – I don't know if he got fired, got replayed, but the Falcons beat writer was no longer on the beat. They put me in. And so that's how I got back to covering the NFL and covering the Falcons. And, and I love, I love that. I was, that was a really, really, it was a tough beat. It was a different beat because there's a one newspaper town. Um, but there were a lot of challenges. Michael Vick was the show in the NFL. Yeah. Then. And then of course the whole dog fighting stuff which was brutal. I mean, that's what gave me these gray hairs. I mean, that was, that was as hard. That was, that was as, as painful of a 10 or 11 months of a journalist as I've ever had. Cause it Why? divided the city. The, yeah. Well, I mean, look, it divided the city along racial lines. It divided the city along cultural lines because a lot of rural people saw nothing wrong with dog fighting. That's just something that they did. And other people were just so completely offended by it. The majority of people were so completely offended by it, including myself. Um, especially because, you know, we had sources, again, that me and my partner, Daryl Ledbetter, who still covers the team, um, had sources that nobody else were going to have, you know, legal sources, other sources that knew the real dark underworld of 
dog fighting. So a lot, a lot of stuff I wish I didn't know. Yeah. Um, but you know, it was, it was a really painful thing. Cause I mean, citizens, the, the readers that they were just killing, they were killing me and Daryl, you know, we're two black or we were two black reporters from Howard. Um, and I mean, we were just getting murdered. Like we're picking on Mike Vick and the whole time we're knowing like he is going to get in trouble. This is, you know, but with so much of the stuff was off the record. Yeah. Um, but I mean, people had flipped on him early in the process. It was, it was really ugly. And then, you know, I knew Mike, I had a great relationship with Mike and I'm like, damn, this guy's did he did this, you know, I, I just couldn't believe it. But at the same time, I'm like, I got to believe it because, you know, I've got information that says so. And so then when everything came out, you know, where he confessed and this and that, everyone's like, oh, you were right. I'm like, it wasn't a matter of being right. We're not trying to prove that we were right. We were doing our jobs. If you feel guilty, that's on you for judging us. Um, but it was ab- it was just absolutely brutal. On top of it, it was the whole Bobby Petrino <laughs> coming to coach the team and then walking out on the team with three games left in the middle of the season. It was a disaster. They're just there. Do you feel like you've, I mean, you've got the, um, your Herald days, you've got your post days and there are big stories in each of those cities. Do you feel like you've had more than your fair share as a beat writer or do you feel I'm, like I'm ready? I'm ready for the next one. It's not like all of a sudden, you know, I'm exhausted. No, no, I understand that. Yeah. But, but I, 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 if I talk to other beat writers who've bounced around to three or four different cities over their career, 30 years, do you feel like they've had the number of, of big stories you've had? It's inter- that's a great question. I've never been asked that question. Some, some, but I mean, look, two of the stories I, again, it wasn't me just being that dude. It was circumstance timing. The Michael Vick dog fighting thing and the Colin Kaepernick not standing for the national anthem thing were two very unique, very culturally changing, societal changing stories. Because Michael Vick, I mean, remember the NFL started putting in rules like, hey, if a player gets arrested, we can go back and get his signing bonuses. We can get his bonus money. Because before that, you know, they, they couldn't, they had to sue to get Michael Vick's bonus money that they paid him. And they, and they put in all of these things now, these, these clauses as to where somebody misbehaves like that. And then it's the whole thought of a major athlete. He was one of the first $100 million football players fighting dogs. Like what? You know, he wasn't the only one, but he was the one who got caught, right? Yeah. And then the cap thing, of course, this is a story, you know, he could have go down in history books. And again, it wasn't me searching for that. It was something that happened where I was. And I happened to be the person to speak to him. So, yeah, I mean, look, not everybody is going to be able to say that. And I think that's, that's why I have some of the trust and gravitas that I do. Um, but again, it's not anything special that I did other than do my job. I want to go back. You mentioned, you know, that foresight that you had, uh, kind of reading the the writing on the wall mm-hmm. in that move from DC to Atlanta, in that move from Mizzou to Howard. Where'd that foresight come from? Is that something that you feel like you've you've always had? Yep. Did your parents uh, develop? I mean, where'd that come from? I've always been able to recognize. You know, you heard me say earlier. I've always been able to kind of play to my strengths. It's a weird kind of instinctive thing play to my strengths right just play i know how to work this situation work it avoid this one and it's just been a very uncanny um deal i mean for example like at the nfl network i was in the first uh rendition of what is now good morning football we called it nfl am we did it here in la we showed up at midnight. We're on air hot at three in the morning Pacific time. It was awful. It was awful. <laughs> but it learned me, you know, it was the first time I really had an immersion of studio work. I was mainly a field reporter. Right. And so being able to host sometimes or carry segments sometimes, I was now 
doing what my journalistic muse, Anderson Cooper, was doing, right? I could field report, I could host, I could moderate panels, I could do these things. So when, after two years, I was like, I got to get off the show. I, I, mean, I just can't physically do the show anymore. Um, and they were like, well, what show can we put, put you on? I was like, why do I have to be on a singular show? I would let me be your, your I'm, you know, I'm a, a big history guy. Let me be your Hall of Fame guy. And the fact that I really immersed myself in our Hall of Fame coverage, we now have four shows a year partnering with the Hall of Fame. You know, let me be your kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, your ethnic guy where we're enhancing Polynesian coverage, right. HBCUs, a lot of this stuff where we can have these powerful discussions. So it's always... Hey, man, if there is an opening, do not be afraid to run through it. And it, it, I, I really, the big belief I had in that was a guy named uh, Ray Anderson, who's now the athletic director at Arizona State. But he used to work in a league office. He was an executive with the Falcons when I covered him. And I consulted him before I left the print business to come work for the NFL Network. Because anyone who does that always has the, am I giving up my journalistic integrity by going to work for somebody who signs my paychecks, yeah. right? Who, who covers somebody who signs my paycheck. And he's like, look, sometimes you've got to jump off the cliff and either fall on your face or trust the rip cord when you pull it. And so when, again, when I see opportunities now, like this year, I'm going to start, I'm going to call the uh, Falcons preseason games and I'm going to do some work for the team in that regard. Like, I've never done that. You know, when we did arena league football, I did that uh, a couple of times and I, and I was good at it and I liked it. So I'm going to try it. Do a play by play or, or analyst color. It's going to be color. Okay. Okay. And so look, I'm one of the non NFL players doing it, but you know, Mina Kimes of ESPN does this with the Rams in a very, they have a three person booth and it's a great touch that she adds to because she's great. She knows her stuff. She's a great storyteller, but she adds just a little bit of spectacular hot sauce that makes it all work and so i'm hoping to be that guy in a three-person booth in atlanta like she inspired me to, to search this out and i wanted to do it a team that i was familiar with but also a team that i don't cover much so people can't say well you're showing favoritism or you're you're hard to, you're, you're not going to crack down on them because you know you 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 work for them as well in, in, in a in a contributor basis i'm like nope let's get away from that so i don't look like i'm playing Right. playing for the home team yeah the the kind of the vin scully side of things where it's mm -hmm. like i i will call it like i see it and yep. the the team and fans will appreciate it yeah so you know it's just always it's like in an eight in an eight thing hey it's you know you see what's coming you see what's coming i live in, i live in a neighborhood here in la that is just gentrifying overnight and five or six years ago i told my wife like we need instead of renting we've got to buy because in two years, these homes are going to be unaffordable. So we were able to get in, we yeah. read the tea leaves. Nice, nice. And, and, and so, you know, we got in. So it's just always been kind of an innate thing, even since I was a little kid. Uh, back to the Falcons calling the games. Uh, how is it going to be without Julio Jones? Uh, it's not, <laughs> it's not going to be easy. I mean, he's one of the greatest players, you know, to play that position in NFL history. It's, you're losing a great player, but he did not want to be there. It is, he was over it. He was done with it in a lot of ways. And with a new head coach and a new regime coming in, it's like, look, and we see this happen a lot, you know, we want to have somebody who's got this massive presence, be unhappy, potentially impact other players that we're trying to establish kind of our own culture here. Do you want to have them, him kind of be a negative element here, um, despite his greatness? you know, at some point is going to be become toxic. So it's going to be tough for them. Look, Calvin Ridley is going to be a fantastic player. He is a number one wide receiver. He'd be a number one wide receiver for, you know, any team that doesn't have, you know, Devontae Adams or, or some of these really great elite players. But, you know, it, they've got to figure out how they're going to navigate without having a, a dynamic player like him. It is a different they don't have, you know, they've got Mike Davis at running back. It's not like they've got, you know, Alvin Kamara or someone back there who can pose this threat. You know, they've got Kyle Pitts, the new rookie tight end. And he's, you know, he's expected to be great. But how many rookie tight ends come in and completely change the tenor of a game 
out of the gate. You know, the George Kittles, the world happened a year or two down the line. Um, but this year is going to be a really, I think it's really going to be kind of a, the salary cap reckoning, you know, look last year, where they won four games, they should be better than that. But are they a playoff team? You know, that all depends on, <laughs> it all depends on how the breaks go and in, in, in their health because depth wise and everything they're impacted. Where's Aaron Rodgers playing next year? I don't think he's playing. I, I really, I think really? It's, it's salvageable. I think it's salvageable in Green Bay because Aaron loves to play. You know, people talk, he loves the game so much, but it's not healthy. It's not healthy in Green Bay. And, you know, if he decides to sit out, I don't think it's any skin off his nose. I think he's kind of like, I'm. other great players have done it. Barry Sanders did it. Jim Brown did it. Megatron did it. You know, people have bounced when they just have not, and happy when it comes down to it. This is like Deshaun Watson. He's not going to play for Houston this year. So, I, you know, look, I think it's salvageable in Green Bay, but when push comes to shove, he's made a ton of money. Even if he cancels, doesn't get the $30 million or has to give back money, He's, I think he's still okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think so. I think so. Je- Jeopardy is always there, right? Jeopardy is always there. I was in the audience uh, when you were on a panel a couple of years ago at the Barrett Sports Media Summit here mm-hmm. in Los Angeles. I really admired uh, what you set up there on that panel and uh, loved our conversation today, Steve. Thank you so much. Aaron, fantastic job. Really appreciate you. Thanks for watching the Aaron Bender podcast, whether it's on YouTube, IGTV, or DB and A TV streaming online at DB and A television TV nightly 11 p.m. Pacific 2 a.m. Eastern or the DB and A TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire, or listening on your favorite platform. Thanks for watching. Be well.